Welcome to a demonstration of IRENA capabilities to fit uh, two populations of nanoparticles. Um, in this case I want to show you or demonstrate a more or less uh, mechanically mechanical type of analysis of small angle scattering data provided to me by a user. Um, ideally, this analysis would be directed by very good scientific knowledge of the problem and uh, lots of other information from imaging and other techniques which would guide me to the right solution. However, in this case I was provided with a data set. A data set is kind of good enough to give us an opportunity to do a analysis based on purely small angle scattering principles which may or may not be the right analysis for this specific set of samples. Uh, but it's actually good enough, um, data are good enough to guide us through a some kind of reasonable analysis. I do show this type of analysis in IRENA NICA courses, which are held about twice or three times a year at various places, mostly at the APS. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, I want to walk you through an import of the data and pre-processing of the data, plotting of the data and then analysis itself so you understand how to grapple with the small angle scattering data uh, per se based on you know the small angle scattering itself. So first thing is what I have here is an Igor Pro, the current version is 6.36 and I have installed in there IRENA macros. So I'm gonna start IRENA macros and I need to import the macros, uh, the import the data from an ASCII file because the file is available to me as ASCII. So I'm going to pick an ASCII import tool and uh, here is the main GUI for it. Now in case you don't necessarily like the font sizes, if you feel the font doesn't look too good, you can first optimize the uh, graphical interface. So you can go in and set and configure default font and names and you can pick for example you would like to have an, a smaller font like Times New Roman which makes it a little bit easier to read. You can change the font sizes and so on. So, so now if we have a GUI graphical interface which is useful we're going to point ourselves to the data path and in this case the data are stored in a other examples folder which is where I'm currently pointing. If not, I'm just browse to that folder in here and then I'm going to pick on that. That turns out to be on only one file. You can now simply double click on the file and what happens is that the file will open up in a text view and you can see from here that we have a Q, intensity and error and then we have the Q values are probably inverse, inverse angstroms because that's a little bit too small numbers for inverse nanometers. Uh, that's something which you need to know and then we have intensity and we have um, error. The other thing to note is that these you know numbers look kind of high and, and, and we do not have any information if the intensity is a d sigma d omega in calibrated units or not so we will assume it's not. It's not calibration, calibrated data. So what the IRENA needs here is to know which column of the data is Q so that's the first one, intensity and error. Uh, then we can simply import the data, look at them and decide if they are appropriate for fitting or not. So I'm going to just leave everything else as it is and say import. Down here in the history area you will see that it has imported the data and it has created new waves which is the Igor speak for columns of data. So now we have the data inside the Igor, what's called Igor experiment. If you look on that, there is a data browser. If you don't have it, you can find it in data, data browser. This is a view inside the Igor experiment itself. You don't care about anything which is inside packages folder. What you care about is a data we imported, which is the SAS imported data. And out here you can see that there's a two population on a material. If you don't see the stuff inside, the blue little wiggly boxes, those are the waves. So you can check the waves. And that now shows us this is a Q value, two population on a material. It's a floating point 64, it's a 381 
points and so on. There's an intensity, there is a uncertainty. So now we have the data in Igor experiment and we can now look at them. And if you want to plot them, what you do is you go in, pick a plotting tool, data were imported as a QRS wave names. In other words, the Q has a Q in front and then it has the rest of the name R as is an intensity, as is an error. Don't ask why these, these names, but anyway. If you now check this little checkbox, you will see only the folders of data which contain QRS waves. You can pick it. It Then the tool also knows how to pre-fill these selections. Here you can add the data. And you now have a you now have a graph which shows you the data. Now let's have a look on the data and make first some decisions on if these data should be imported this way or not. The first thing to note is that the first and second data point obviously are wrong. There's they must be Im impacted by a beam stop or something because clearly there is no scientific reason, small angle scattering, why the data would turn down and go down that way. So the first and second point seem to be wrong, and really any data below 0.01 are simply garbage. We should not even have them in there because we don't need them. The other thing to note is that as you go to higher and higher angles, there's lots and lots more points out there which have a really very low information content. There's really just a noise in them. And so either we could truncate them, but then we lose some information which is still left in them. What I prefer to do is actually go and do a log step rebinning. When you do that, you will reduce the number density of the points at high angles. Basically, at the high angles, at the noisy areas, you will average over larger ranges of cues which is perfectly fine, it reduces the noise, it keeps most of the information which is there, and for the least square fitting routine which we're going to use for optimization, that actually helps tremendously because it simplifies its life and it kind of numerically better balances the system. So, now we're looking on these data, so obviously we want to trim the start and we want to do some kind of rebinning on that. Let's go back to the import tool and see if we can do it. So I'll close these two windows and we go back to this one. First thing is we can set trim data. If we send trim data, I said anything below 0.01 seemed to have been on the graph wrong, and you can see it in this in this here. The first point clearly has less intensity than the second point. The second point has about the same as the third point, which it really should not in this case, and then only the real data start. The other thing is if you go to the end of the data all the way, you will find out that there is a, at least one last point which obviously has zero intensity and zero error, which means it's, again, there was not measured data anyway. So what I would suggest here is go in and just remove the last few points. So I'm going to trim the start and trim the end. The other thing is, notice there's this big red thing which says you have found so many points, do you want to reduce that? Um, I would go in and say, yes, let's reduce the points. It will do a log reduce of the points. And what we can do is we can reduce the number of points like 120. Now, you have to reduce the number of points to one third of less what it found here. So you cannot do 200 points because it just doesn't know what to do with that. It has to reduce enough. So in this case, 120 points is probably reasonable. You're going to see that in a second. So uh, then we, you could do a few other things in here. I suggest that you read the manual about what is what are the various options in here. So let's now re-import the data. And notice the Igor now knows that the data already exists and basically is asking, do you want to override the old ones? And we can say yes. Down here, it will say what it did. So there's a, some kind of history area uh, description here. Let's go back to the plotting tool and let's pick on the data again and add them in. Notice that what now we have is we have obviously a reasonable behavior at low Q. We have a very nice behavior out here and as it goes out and out more we get much less noise out here. So now we have a much better conditioned problem, numerically conditioned problem. We have also removed some of the noise at the high angles which otherwise the least square fitting would get confused about. So now we have a data set which is basically ready to do some fitting. 
The other thing we need to think about is how are we going to fit this data set. Now I'm telling you this is two population nanometers. These were two nanometers mixed together. The first thing which you can look at that is there is a obviously a guinea area and there's a kind of secondary hump to it. If the first, if the larger material is sufficiently uh, monodispersed, it would possibly produce these Bessel function oscillations and with a little bit of uh, training in an eye, I can actually tell you this is a second order oscillation of this one, but the Igor, uh, the IRENA code will actually tell us this thing, so we will find out. Then, of course, this data would continue oscillating and falling down. This part here is a second population. Um, it sticks out too much. It must be a second population. So that's the second population. That's a finer, finer smaller size nanoparticles. So we need to fit this with two populations. One of them is going to be nearly monodispersed or relatively monodispersed. The other one is going to be broader because we do not see an oscillations coming out of it. So the low, smaller particles are actually more polydispersed, relatively more polydispersed. So let's close this graph. Let's close this window. Let's close this window and that window. So now we have an Igor experiment which has our data and we want to model the data. For this, the best tool we have is what is called modeling. Uh, modeling 2, because the second version, there used to be in version number 1. When you open the modeling 2 panel, you get again the same choices for the data. We pick QRS and we pick the nanomaterial. And then here are data controls, the checkbox data controls. We can add the data in here and pop the data are inside here. In this graph. This put the data in there. Now we can immediately look at it and say what are we going to do with the Q range we're going to model. Obviously if you look on this area here at high angles the data are coming down and then they're coming flat and they're going to come again. I believe anything above 0.4 is probably not very useful and you can use the choices out here in this area Q min and Q max to select a fitting range. There are various ways to do that. We may actually do it a little bit later with other ways. But then, um, the other thing is we can kind of look at that and see well, if this was a small angle scattering properly subtracted only small angle scattering, the data would be basically coming down as a, some kind of porous slope Q2 minus 4 or similar to it. And it, this, these data tend to flatten out. They tend to flatten out, and so that means there's some flat background which was not subtracted. And if you look on this here, that's 1.987654, so it's probably the background in this somewhere like 0.2 or 0.3. So that's an amount of flat background, that is. Now we can go and do an, and, and build a model. So we're going to go and click on the model controls. Here is 10 populations, and if you don't see all of them, you can do the same thing, configure default fonts and make the font smaller. If we make it smaller, you now see all 10 tabs, okay? So, but for you to see it better, I'm going to make it a little bit larger, and I'm going to go back to 12 so it's easier to read on your screens. So there will be 10 possible populations, and each population can be a size distribution of particles, it can be a unified fit level or it can be a diffraction peak. So I'm going to use the first one. I'm going to leave it as a size distribution. I'm going to say these are large nanoparticles. And just to see if you have a fast enough computer, if you just simply hit this auto recalculate, it will automatically, anytime you make a change in the parameters, it will automatically update the curve, so you can easily see what the curve is. The other thing is, it's actually easier to work with a Gaussian distribution, um, because it's easier to understand what these parameters mean. So I'm going to make it a Gaussian distribution. Now, in order, what we have for Gaussian, we have a mean and we have a full weighted half max or standard deviation. Those are similar parameters that are linked together. So let me make the population relatively narrow. I'm going to make it 5. And what you see is if this was a 150 angstrom particle, and notice we are, we are modeling volume distribution of radii. So this mean size now is a radius. You can change those things. 
in more parameters you can model diameters and you can model number distribution um, in our case it doesn't matter but it's important to know what you are doing and think about that correctly anyway so now what we have is we have 150 angstroms particles and you can see that they're slightly shifted to lower Q so what that means is that we can probably make a few steps to smaller sizes uh, so somewhere out here now the other thing is this these data are on arbitrary scale so we have a contrast and we have a scale the scale would be like a volume fraction but that's only volume fraction if you have an add data on absolute scale and you have the right contrast in this case it probably doesn't matter uh, so I'm going to set the value 0 here to 0 0.5 or so and <coughs> we can change that again so now I'm getting closer but this is too narrow so I can change this to maybe 15 okay that's better so now what we have is we have the data are reasonably well you know closer fitted here than, than anywhere else uh, if you want to reset this graph you can hit auto set axis and then if you want this, this, this graph not to change as you are working on it you can read the axis that's going to make sure that the graph scaling doesn't change all the time so this is coming closer and then we have the second oscillation the next thing is we have to deal with this population of finer particles if we don't have those modeled in any way we really cannot do much modeling because the data are contaminated by the small angle scattering of these small particles till at least here there's not much data left so what we do after we now go in and select a second population so let's go in and create a second population of particles these will be small nanoparticles and what I want to do is do again a Gaussian distribution let's make it narrower and let's uh, make it smaller now in order to see these it might be easier to just switch off the large so if you go P1 and disable that you can now see that <clears throat> we have particles are a population here so the next thing is we want to get it close to the data we're trying to fit which is this area of data so to do that we can again scale this one up by a factor of 10 uh, make this maybe 4 and so I am going to fit these data as close as I can now notice one thing is I'm gonna zoom in the area notice that this is a curve for a size distribution here even if I make the standard deviation very very narrow you will see that let me zoom again you will see that the data themselves the measured points are sharper than the uh, than the small angle scale basically they are sharper than the sphere the guinea area of the sphere and what that means is that <clears throat> most likely this data set is aggregated or, or, or is concentrated enough that there is a structure factor in there so we're looking on particles which do have some structure factor to do that to account for that we can pull one of the many structure factors implemented here let's pick this hard spheres and if we pick hard spheres and put it down in this area these the radius which is the distance the, the radius distance of hard spheres should be something which is nearby the mean size remember this is a radius that's a radius so that may be like 30 angstroms and let me put a volume fraction this is a volume fraction um, so it should be less than 0.6 or so and and for various reasons if you want to automatically recalculate with this window here you have to hit twice the um, 
the uh, enter key. So with, with this, you can actually modify the shape of the curve uh, in such a way that it's much closer to what we have uh, than as the measured data. Now, so what we want to do is make this wider, maybe more, now oh, the other way. So here is, okay. so that's here. A guess, a good guess. Uh, make this one point one five. That's going to make the the shape of this curve sharper. So now, with this, we can start doing some fitting. First thing is let's switch on back uh, this population here, the first population, and let's pick some parameters to fit. Do not start with fitting all the parameters at once. You always have to start with fitting just a few parameters and the ones which dominate most. So typically scale will fit, it will, will dominate. And in this case, let's pick mean size and we let's leave the standard deviation unchecked. In this case, scale is important, uh, mean size may be important, and I would fit, I would pick the volume fraction in here. Um, and then we can do a fit model here. What it does, it presents us with the list of parameters we are fitting. That's because I have noticed that sometimes people just fit too many parameters and they actually forgot which parameters they are fitting. So this screen here shows which parameters are going to be fitted. So we're going to continue fitting and we have got some optimization here. The next thing is if it, if it reach the reasonable numbers, we can look at it and say, well, do we like these numbers? Uh, did it go in any way in a non-physical way? Sometimes the mathematically best solution is physically impossible. So it's really critical to look at that and think about if these parameters are in any way physically possible. Um, there's not much we can say about these because we really don't understand much about the physics here. So I'm going to add the standard deviation here. I'm going to add a radius here. The other thing is we're using least square fitting and it has it is bound by some of these some of, by these minimum and maximum limits. So sometimes what you want to do is there is there are buttons which relax the uh, parameters along the their standard numbers. So for example here is 0.16 but the limits stack around with whatever the number originally was. So we may actually have to fix the limits. When you hit fix the limits with L1, you relax a little bit. If you do L3, you relax much more. So that basically centers the limits which uh, limits on your, on your parameters. Let's do fit model again. Now we added a few more parameters in here. Let's do the fitting. Okay. That has helped a little bit, but not that much. Now let's add the last parameter in here, and we have one more parameter. There is a background here which we can fit to. So let's, uh, and that's associated with the data themselves. So let's go back here, say fit, continue fitting. Okay, and now we have actually a really nice fit to the data. Here is a plot of normalized residuals. It's not perfect but at least it's randomly distributed around the curve. So there's some oscillations up and down, but we're not misfitting systematically low angle or high angle. Um, we have a plot of populations. So we have one population around 20 angstroms, slightly more than that. We have broader population out here, but because it's also much larger, this one has produces the vessel functional oscillation. This one does not. And this is the uh, these are the parameters for uh, the structure factor itself. So what we can do with this, we can, first thing is we can tags, put the tags into uh, the graph. So what we have here is it puts and informs us what, it, what the parameters are themselves. Um, the other thing we can do it, we can store it in a notebook. And if you put it, it creates a Igor notebook. It, the Igor notebook can be saved as 
and you can save it as a RTF file, a rich file. And if you do it, you you can then open it in a text document, uh, in a Word document, uh, in a Word or some other thing. Um, then it makes some records here, including the graphs, um, including everything what it knows about that. So you can you can generate a text output, which you can then store the data in uh, the, the results in and then export it and have it as a notebook. The other thing which you can do is you can store it in data folder and give it a text and a name. Say continue. And now if you go back in the Igor experiment, here is what you have. So these three are the data which we loaded in. That's the data displayed here. Q is the x-axis, R is the red points intensities and s are the uncertainties around that we have fitted that with an intensity and q vector as a model and then we had these are the radii and then we have a number <coughs> distribution and volume distribution associated with those um, you can then go and for example plot those if you decide that you want to plot the results you can go in say plotting uh, you can either pick qrs these are the data and then you can say Irina results and in here you can pick the intensity and that would be a example of how you fitted the data uh, the other thing which you can do is kill you can go in and pick and say I have radii and I want to do volume distributions add it in and then pick a style which represents volume distribution and here is your volume distributions there's a lot more details involved with this, including um, using tools like analyze uncertainty of these parameters. You can go in and you can use that tool to analyze how precisely what is the uncertainty of some of these parameters. There are other things which you can do here, but lots of those are either in the movie directly on modeling too, or you have to read the manual or you have to come for the IRENA course because it gets excessively long and complicated and it requires actual discussions. But anyway, I hope I have shown you that if the data have enough information and you know at least something about them, in this case we could hopefully trust the fact that we can use spheres because we are using spheroid with aspect ratio 1 as a form factor, so we can use spheres as a model. Hopefully that's close enough to the real materials. Uh, so with that with some uncertainties about you know making choices like is it a Gaussian distribution and a few other things we have generated a small angle scattering which well satisfies or well describes these these measured curves and assuming we're not too far from some of these assumptions we actually have a solution for our small angle scattering data now the last thing which you always want to do is unless you want to lose all your data you want to go in save the Igor experiment you want to pick a place for your Igor experiment and then give it a name then when you save that all of this information all of this data everything is inside that Igor experiment you can always come back to it otherwise you do not have any real output and just make sure you save the Igor experiment before you have done okay so for now that's all as I said the whole thing is much much more complicated but you can see at least some uh, procedure how to analyze this type of data in, in IDNA package